Welcome back, everyone. I'm State Senator Kevin Wickos to this month's edition of Veterans Corner. With me today in the beautiful town of Barkhamsted is Paul Kramarczyk, who served as a second-class petty officer aboard the USS Patrick Henry, which, by the way, is a boat, not a ship. Paul, thanks for being on the show. Nice to be here. Why don't you tell a little bit of the folks about uh, a little bit about your background and what is the uh, the difference between a boat and a ship? They may not be aware of because I wasn't aware. Well. I'll start with a little bit of background. Um, I was the oldest of six, graduated high school, 66, uh, oldest of six in a three-bedroom house, went to college for a year. This was, you know, 67, 68 time frame. Uh, I didn't like the pace of college. I liked learning, didn't like the pace. College right. was not for me. And, of course, the Vietnam War was on then. Uh, draft, they had a, a draft then. And uh, so I had a friend of mine who enlisted in the Navy nuclear power program. And he explained that to me. It was a six-year enlistment, but you get a lot of schooling with it. So that looked interesting to me. I joined the Navy. It is about the modern United States Great, Navy right. submarine, an awesome weapon system, a superior fighting machine created out of the expanding knowledge of today's modern technology. But more important, it's about the men upon whom the machine depends. The men who run it, guide it, and make it do its job. For these men represent thousands more around the globe, from Pearl Harbor to Holy Lock, from New London to Sasebo. Men who stand literally at the forefront of the free world's defensive strength. The officers and men of the United States Navy Submarine Force. Now, how new was nuclear power at, at that time? Well, or had it been around for a while? But ten in years. Government. Let's call it, in the Navy, let's call it ten years. Uh, the Nautilus launched when? Late 50s, maybe 58 okay. or so. And that was the first nuclear that power? That was the first nuclear powered submarine. And uh, it went under the ice well, and around the Arctic. Uh, and, and then from, from, from the Nautilus, they kept upgrading the design and building more and more nuclear submarines. Continuing advances in nuclear power plants combined with improvements in hull design and the development of a solid-fueled Polaris missile produced the dramatic and strategically potent Fleet Ballistic Missile Weapons System. Single propeller submarines with higher speeds and improved handling characteristics carry 16 Polaris missiles capable of reaching any land-based target on Earth. George Washington in 1959 was the first. The others also bear the names of American patriots. So, went into the Navy, boot camp, and A school. Uh, my first ship after A school was the Northampton, CC-1, USS Northampton, CC-1. And we went down to Guantanamo Bay to uh, test everything. It, it, they call it an ORI, Operational uh, Readiness Exam, Inspection. Yeah. So, on our way down to Gitmo, uh, Gitmo was a prison then, it was basically just a sure. U.S. naval base. Uh, they landed on the moon July 20, 69. I was at sea on my way down to Gitmo. So we did our own, I spent the summer of 69 in Guantanamo. Summer of 69 was also Woodstock. Sure. So I didn't know about Woodstock until I come back to the U.S. So come back uh, from Gitmo, then I started nuclear power school. And nuclear power school is a lot different than college. This is a simplified schematic drawing of a nuclear propulsion plant. This is the reactor, and this the steam propulsion machinery. The reactor, encased in heavy shielding, contains fuel elements of highly enriched uranium. Control rods of neutron absorbing material control the activity of the reactor as they are inserted or withdrawn. As controlled fissioning or splitting of uranium atoms occurs in the reactor, tremendous heat results. This heat is carried to a steam generator by highly pressurized water. Here, the heat is transferred to less highly pressurized water, which is converted into steam to drive the ship's propulsion turbine and turbine generator sets. The turbine generator sets provide all the electricity required aboard the ship. That's a lot of science. That's a lot of a short period of time. You, it, 
the whole program is self-selecting. In other words, you have to be sort of science back oriented. You have to like technology, uh, whether it's electrical engineering, uh, mechanics, navigation, whatever it is. So it self-selects people, and in order to go into submarines, that's all 100% volunteer. So they weren't assigned that at boot camp where a recruiter said, we're assigning you to a no, submarine. No, no, you no, no. You have to want no. to serve in this capacity? Nobody wants somebody on a submarine who doesn't want to be there. Okay. You have to want to be there. And then even if you want to be there, uh, whether you're accepted as a crew member or not is up to the crew. So how, how does that work? What do you mean when it's up to the crew? They well, you have to qualify. Let me go back to nuclear power school. So you go to nuclear power school for about six months. That's classroom every day. Then you go to prototype school, where the Navy ha ha has at several places around the country a actual working reactor. We had one in Windsor, Connecticut, designed and built by Combustion Engineering, uh, right off the Hill Road in Windsor. That prototype has been since decommissioned. Uh, but there's prototypes around the country mm -hmm where you have a submarine reactor plant built on land. They have a big tank of water that right. they use to simulate the ocean, you know, the, the ocean. And you operate that, you learn to operate that plant for about another six months. So if you come out of there, you've had the schooling, the classroom work, you've had the practical work, and along the way you have to, you're tested and you have to sort of qualify, right. you know, you have a big sign-off yep. uh, sheet. Uh, and then, it, depending on what your rate is, what your job is, and Navy rate is sort of what your job is, um, you may have to go to another school. After prototype, I went on to what's called ELT school, engineering lab tech school. And that's where you learn to be, once you get aboard, the resident health physicist, you measure radiation, you take ra uh, radioactive right. samples, you do the chemistry on the reactor, the radiochemistry, you do the secondary chemistry, the, the chemistry of the steam plant. Uh, it's important to know so the that's ins another, and outs of, of That's the an boat. order of four or five months. Sure. Then I was assigned to the Patrick Henry coming out of ELT school. Patrick Henry is a, one of the uh, original class of fleet ballistic missile submarines. Now, originally, they had what, were, what we call attack boats. These are submarines that go out and try and sink other submarines or enemy ships. Okay. And their main weapon is torpedoes. Now, since we could stay underwater for long periods of time, and the Cold War was very hot then, um, Soviet Union was building submarines. Soviet Union had long-range launch strategic missiles aimed at the United States. We responded in kind. Now, we were in a Cold War with... with Russia, Soviet but Union. the Viet, the Soviet Union, right? But the USSR, but the the Vietnam War was currently taking place. Yes, the we Vietnam War was in. sort of a proxy war for the Cold War. Right. At least that was our opinion. In fact, it wasn't much. In my opinion, it wasn't much of a proxy war. I mean, as you can see, we left Vietnam. You know, we just basically folded up and went home. Sure. And mm -hmm. no, so I was not involved. I knew about the Vietnam War uh, while I was off crew. You know, while I was. Uh, not on the boat, uh, I would meet you know, people from Vietnam all over the place, uh, veterans. So I knew of it, but that was not what, what my was job was. your mission, was. right. My job, let me go back to the design of the submarine. Of the submarine. Mm -hmm. What we wanted to do is have strategic launch capability that would deter enemy launch. In other words, if we could build a missile launch system that we could hide somewhere, and it would survive a first strike, then that missile system would deter any first strike because it's a no-win situation. That's what fleet ballistic missile submarines were for, and we have them today. So what they did, they took the, the uh, Thresher-class attack boat, cut it in half, and welded it in a missile compartment. We had 16 launch tubes, launch uh, tubes, and we carried 16 intercontinental sea launch ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. So you, your mission was to travel wherever Our uh, mission, you were deployed to and sit and or just yeah, you're not routine quite patrols setting, and then if you had something then you were, Our you job, could potentially be 
Our job was those to go missiles. out on patrol and remain undetected and be ready to launch if the president says, you know, it comes to that. Right. So our job was you go out on patrol, that is you go out in the ocean somewhere and hide. And your job is to just be ready to launch. So you're just kind of paddling around the ocean at depth. Uh, and and uh, What does that depth mean? Like well, patrol underneath? depth. Like I hear the movies, you know, run silent, run deep. Are you deep in the water or are you kind of just a little well, ways under so you can satellites on. or bring the boats doing. can't see you? Um, patrol depth might be, you know, a few hundred feet. Okay. Uh, so the job is to get out there, be ready to launch, and remain undetected. That means don't make a lot of noise because Soviet attack boats are constantly looking for our missile boats. Our attack boats are trying to track Soviet attack boats so they can take them out before they take us out. What's important is that we get our missiles off. Sounds almost like a cat and mouse game it's where a big cat everybody's mouse looking game. for it's each other. It's a global cat and mouse game. So I report to the Patrick Henry. It's in refueling an overhaul in Bremen Shipyard on the Olympic Peninsula, right across Puget Sound from Seattle. Gorgeous area, absolutely stunning. Especially back then, this was before all the Californians sold their houses for a lot of money and retired up right. to, to the state of Washington. Absolutely stunning. Mount Rainier, the whole thing. But what's lucky, I was lucky in my timing. I mean, it was just fate that my timing was such that I picked up the boat during refueling, so the boat was torn oral apart. The hull cuts, they're replacing things, putting new systems in, a new core. And once you put all that back together, you've got to do a lot of testing. So you learn, you get there at a point in time to learn a lot about the design and operation of the sure. boat. Now, why is it a boat and not a ship? Submarines are just called boats because they're very small. They used to be small. Now they're quite big. But they still call them boats. I mean, that's just a tradition. Now, traditionally, you told me it's a little different that, um, at least as a submariner, and I don't know if that's the correct term, Submariner, yeah. uh, that it's all about the boat, not about the individual. And share with everybody well, what, that, what you meant by that. A boat is different. A submarine is different. There's no lifeboats on a, on a submarine. And what you learn when you get there, and it's almost a subconscious learning, is that if you want to go home, you have to save the boat because it's the boat that's going to get you home. You can't scheme or connive or take a certain job and avoid the problem of losing the boat. If you lose the boat, you lose the whole crew. I mean, that's the history of submarines. Right. You don't survive. When, a submarine, when you lose a submarine, you lose the crew. That's it. So it's a very special uh, relationship. The people you work with are closer than family. Li I'm not kidding you either. You are literally closer than family because you spend so much time together and you have to depend on one another. You know, eventually, even if you know your job very well, you eventually need to sleep. So you have to relieve your, uh, give your job over to someone else that you've got to trust enough that you can go up and get some sleep. Right. Management and leadership responsibilities that would come at a much slower pace in the outside world are there from the beginning. He's an integral part of an elite team, responsible not only for the management and upkeep of a massive amount of equipment, but for the continuing education and training of the men under him, seeing to their professional advancement. In addition, he spends considerable time behind this door, qualifying as an engineering officer of the watch on the submarine's nuclear propulsion plant. Simultaneously, he also serves in the attack or control center, qualifying as diving officer of the watch, and ultimately as officer of the deck, surfaced and submerged. So, like I said, in an airplane, you may have an airplane crash. Some survive, some don't. You know, an army patrol in Iraq, some survive, some don't. In the submarine, you either save the boat or nobody goes home. It was interesting. It's all about the boat. And because you understand that, uh, I mean, the deal is you, you, you respect each other so much because you literally have to sleep and trust your life with this guy's knowledge. Now, and a submarine is probably one of, you know, I don't know all the 
branches of the service, all the little groups. But a submarine crew member or submarine service is probably one of the least, what I would call, military. You know, where shine shoes and buckles and that sort of, you know, I love all that stuff. Um, but what's important in a submarine is how well do you know the boat? Because when things don't go as planned, everybody's got to look at you. What should we do right. to get us home? It's the people who know information and how to operate the boat that are going to get you home. And your job is to try and be one of those people. Now, have you, when you were out on, on maneuvers patrol. or patrol, patrol, was there ever a time where you felt, oh, my God, what, what's going on? Because you're isolated if you're a couple hundred feet under the water. Um, the only communication I'm assuming you have is via whatever the captain decides to tell the, well, the yeah. crew. When you're we're not getting newspapers. The, now, let me explain a little bit more. Uh, so we refuel in Bremerton, and you do a lot of great, interesting things. Uh, you do sound tests where you dangle from, from cables and, and water and you know, submerge and you run various pieces of equipment so that we can know what are the quiet, what is the quietest configuration of the boat. You know, let's say you have two pumps A and B. Right. If A is quieter than B, when you go to ultra quiet or you want to be quiet, you run A, not B. That sort of thing. And all that goes throughout the boat. So you do a lot of interesting tests. You do angles and dangles where you might take a high speed run and then you do a stern plane sham dive. A stern plane is like, I don't know, the, the back wing of an airplane. Okay, yep. Where you put the stern plane in jam dive, and you start to dive. Now, how you get out of that is you do a back emergency. You actually reverse the propellers to try and pull yourself out. Very exciting. <laughs> okay. A lot, lot, <laughs> lot of vibration, but the thing works. And what that does is that builds confidence in the design and operation right. of the boat. Now... From Bremerton, we come down to the Panama Canal. Now, because I, everybody on a submarine has at least two jobs. Most people have three, at least, because there's, there's only 125 people, 128 people, um, and lots of jobs to do, so you have to learn how to do two or three jobs at least. Uh, so because I was an ELT, a, a radiation guy, uh, when, I, when we surfaced, and we surfaced before we went through the Panama Canal, I'm one of the first guys up. Because what I would do is take radiation readings of the deck of the submarine because we're going to be on a surface all day sure. going through the Panama Canal. And I still remember that surfacing. We're on the Pacific side of the Panama Canal, and the sun was just coming up, and it was just sunrise. Absolutely stunning. Red sky in the tropics. And I could look out in the Pacific, and there's all these uh, civilian transports, you know, just bringing sure. cars and stuff from China or Japan or wherever. And, of course, we had head of the line privileges. You know, U.S. warship, go through the Panama Canal. Go through the canal, it takes about a day, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then we're coming up the, the uh, east coast of the United States. We did a, you do a missile test, you know, you go down to Cape Kennedy and uh, right. uh, blow in some missiles testing. Uh, then finally, the boat gets assigned some patrol place. Where, where are they going to put the 599 on patrol? For the first few years, we uh, took our patrols out of Rota, Spain, and we were mostly on that side of the world. I'm sure, I'm sure it's no secret where we've been, but, sure. but anyways. Now, in those days, Rota, Spain was under Franco, Francisco Franco, yeah. dictator. And because Rota, Spain, now Rota, Spain is on the Atlantic. There's very little bit of mm -hmm. Spain that's on the Atlantic, just around the Straits of Gibraltar. But, in the, but under Franco, Spain's economy was not great. But what that meant was there's not a lot of a development, and the place was beautiful, stunning. No high-rises along the beach and commercial this or that or neon signs. Absolutely Don Quixote beautiful. Spain. Did a couple of runs out of Spain. Now, we have two crews. Only FPMs have two crews. Gold crew, blue crew. Well, I was on Gold Crew. It doesn't matter. You, know, you both do right. the same thing. So Gold Crew takes the boat. You leave from Rota, and you go out on patrol. 90 days or so, 100 days, 85. It's around 90 days that I can remember. Now, this is 45 years 90 ago. 90 days at a clip you would go 90 days on patrol. Out, right. 
uh, you leave your, your patrol port, uh, which was Rhoda, and it, it, you go out to see Lewis, and you submerge, and you stay submerged for the next three months. So you would have food and provisions for how long? I mean, if you're, you knew you were going to be under, underwater for uh, 100, so days, 100 days. You figure 100 days, and maybe more than that if sure. we really wanted to eat some you know, funny stuff. Uh, so we'd be out on patrol for anywhere from, let's say, 85 to 100 days, and I'm just taking guesses. It's, it's somewhere in there. I have probably maybe two, two and a half years submerged time. Um, and once you go on patrol and you're in patrol status, you go on Zulu time, which means Greenwich Mean Time, right. and you're submerged, so day and night doesn't matter to you. There's no windows. And the, your work schedule is usually three section, which means I would do my job, whatever that job was, for six hours, then I'd be off for 12. Okay. So you're on for six, off for 12. And then during the, your off time, you do whatever you want. Sleep, read, play cards. Couldn't go very far. There's nowhere yeah. to go. Right. Uh, it's, it, it's cozy. Um, and so that was your life for the next three months. So you had to be able to live in your head. You had, like I said, it's self-selecting. Sure. Uh, you have to be the kind of person that isn't claustrophobic. I never minded that. Um, and uh, was interested in the submarine, learning about submarines. And me, being a born geek, I mean, it was... Uh, it was a birth defect. I love technology, science, physics, math. Sure. Love it. And so I spent my time trying to learn other people's jobs. Now, my job was some weeks I was the radiation chemistry guy. That means when I was doing my job, I would take reactor coolant mm -hmm. samples or, and radiation readings around the boat. And I would do that for a week or so, maybe two weeks. Then when I'm not doing that, my job was engine room supervisor, where I'd be back in the propulsion plant and running the engine room. Now, we were in what's called engineering. For example, as you're coming back aft from a submarine, you've got the bow, the sail, the right. thing that we call the sail, mm -hmm. missile compartment, then you get to what is called engineering works. You know, then we had the reactor and the propulsion system. So our engineering group, me and others, we were sort of like the public utility. You know, the people who determine where the ship goes and navigate and all that, they're up by the sail in ops compartment. And if they wanted to go fast, they'd ring up a, you know, a full bell or whatever right. uh, on the engine or telegraph, and we would respond, you know, bring the reactor power up, start spinning a screw faster, and the whole thing. So our job was to provide propulsion, how fast we go, forward, reverse, you know, that was our job. Make electricity, we use reactor steam to spin our turbines, make electricity, keep the boat lit, and make fresh water. We brought in seawater, distilled it with reactor steam, and took that nice distilled water and uh, sent it up for drinking and that sort of thing. Community under the sea. Yeah, basically. it, it, it is. And uh, you know, we had other groups that took care of atmospherics. They would sample the atmosphere in a submarine every couple hours. Very clean air. I mean, we had special systems like they have in the space station whose job, whose job it is to keep the air fresh and clean. That, that is, I tell you, science and technology, whether we're up in space or we're, we're under the, the bottom depths of the ocean. Reminds me of a commercial growing up, join the Navy, see an adventure, and from the, some of the ports you If you like adventure, to, this is what you do. <laughs> so, um, so, Paul, one of the things, we, we, we're going to wrap it up, but I wanted to, I always give the veteran an opportunity to send a message to either uh, f their former uh, mates that they serve with or those that are currently serving overseas and, and any of our branches of military. And if there was one thing that you'd like to pass on to uh, those members or people that are thinking about joining the military. Um, well, I can tell you from my experience, um, the greatest privilege of my life was to be accepted as a crew member. Um, 
because you're part of a very tight group of people. I mean, it's a special group of people. And you get to know these people like family. You know, I feel like I could walk into almost any of sure. their houses today, 45 years later, and say, you know, I'm Paul from 599, and it'd be okay. Uh, so there's that aspect, that it's a huge privilege. Next, uh, I'd like to thank the American people for giving me this submarine. Uh, it, it was just amazing. We have the best engineers designing all the systems in this thing, and I had the opportunity to learn how to operate it. It, it was, it was the, a great adventure, an adventure you can't buy. And I want to thank you for the opportunity that you've shared with everybody that's watching this video about what life might be like on uh, serving on a, a United States submarine. Thank you for your service to your country, and uh, thank you for uh, participating in our program today. And tune in next month for another edition of Senator Wickos' Veterans Corner.